Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a PureFlix interview with one Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, who holds a PhD in Cell and Developmental Biology from Harvard. So if anyone knows enough actual biology to be able to expose the fatal flaws of evolution that some YouTube atheists won't be able to counter, this'll be him. So let's see how he does. Some people, some atheists would say, oh, you know, science and faith, they can't go hand in hand. How would you respond to them? Well, I'm sure that some people would say that. I think most people are intelligent enough to realize that the large proportion of scientists that have religious views is itself a demonstration that science and faith are not mutually exclusive. And most of these scientists realize that the science does not necessarily validate their faith, so they keep the science separate from their religion. So that's a question that is designed to bring to mind a specific straw man that creationists often use, where they try to convince their parishioners that the mean, nasty atheists think that science and faith can't go together, but then they show that it can go together because look, here's a guy with a science PhD who is a creationist. That proves the atheists wrong. But as with so many things in creationism, this straw man setup is one of those things that will end up causing more atheists than converts. Because if you grow up learning about a distinction between secular science and creationist science, then when you find out that the creationist science is entirely wrong, you're more likely to just drop your faith entirely than to end up being a Christian who accepts evolution, because you've been told your whole life that it's either evolution and atheism or creation and Christianity. Demonstrate the truth of evolution, and you have just proven Christianity wrong to such a person. So ultimately, the false dichotomy does creationists more harm than good, which I'm okay with. Or what some journalists like to tell me. <laughs> They'd say, you disagree with all of your scientific colleagues. Is there some vast conspiracy, or do we throw out science? Poison, so how, poison door number one, poison door number two. <laughs> well, I mean, in your case, yes, absolutely, it will make you look foolish. Scientists of many different faiths can all agree on the fact that evolution happens, but there is a tiny subset of scientists who insist it is simply a matter of interpretation, but those ones have to ignore or misrepresent the vast majority of the data in order to arrive at their interpretation. Remember when John Morris Pendleton made one of his points by reading the first sentence of the abstract of a study and ignoring the rest of the study? While it is not always quite as drastic as that, stuff like that is commonplace in creationism. One sentence of a study will be quoted as if that one sentence is an accurate summary of the study, but usually it turns out that they were pointing out a problem that the study was attempting to solve. You don't see scientists on the side of evolution behaving this way. So why is it that one side of the argument has to rely almost entirely on misrepresentation? Could it just be that they are wrong? <laughs> knowing that either answer will make us look foolish, and I say there's a third answer. It's that most scientists aren't aware that there's a whole comprehensive, scientifically testable model that exists that explains the day equally well, if not better, than evolution. Most scientists that I am aware of are perfectly well aware of the existence of creationism. It's hard not to be, especially in the United States. But your description of it describing the data equally well, if not better, is completely wrong. Like I said, it's the creationists who have to rely on misrepresentation in order to make their points. If creation actually explained the data just as well as evolution, then you could use an accurate representation of the data to come to that conclusion. You wouldn't have to twist it out of context. But we have an entire educational system that forbids teaching of any of that. And rightly so. Creationism has been so thoroughly debunked that to teach any of it as if it were true does a great disservice to the children learning it. People can say conspiracy or not. That's just the way it is. It's an empirical fact. And most people I run into couldn't tell me what creationists believe. They're shocked when I say we've got testable predictions. Maybe. An unfortunate number of people that you'd just run into would agree with creationism, though. Hopefully a minority, but that depends largely on where you are. And yeah, there is a general misconception among non-creationists that creationism is not science because it doesn't make any testable predictions, and so is unfalsifiable. That is, simply put, not true. Creationism does make testable predictions that would falsify it. 
Unfortunately for creationists, most such predictions were falsified over a century ago, so that's where the misconception comes from. It hasn't made any new predictions, and the only predictions that it has that have not been falsified are the ones that are unfalsifiable. So I don't consider creationism to be unscientific because it makes unfalsifiable claims. I consider it to be unscientific because the claims that it has made have been falsified. So to continue to accept creation as a valid model is, at this point, an unscientific position. It just, it's just all so new, and I can't believe it's true. And part of that's because in their arsenal of arguments against creation, that's predicated on these things not being true. Thing is, though, I don't argue against creationism. I just look into their claims. And very rarely do I come across any claim that has not been adequately and thoroughly addressed several times over and in several different ways. And what I've discovered is there's these cultural barriers that have been erected, these, these almost impenetrable walls, that as soon as they find out just the fact you're creationist, end of discussion. No one's They're gonna not even going to have you on. No interview, nope. no... Uh, not even going to crack the book. They don't. They, they find they're loath to even pay money to buy the book, and so. And for good reason. I don't want my money going to support an organization like Answers in Genesis that actively tries to spread hatred and vitriol. But sometimes I do buy the books, or at least I put them on wish lists for people to buy them for me. Because if I can go through a book and explain why its claims are wrong, then other people don't have to support the organization that produced the books in order to do the same thing. That's the only time I'll tell you not to check my source material, when doing so would support an organization like AIG. But usually with their books, you can find the chapters online individually as standalone blog pieces, so you can still check my contacts when I do do that. He, <laughs> I said doo-doo. 6,000 years as a conversation stopper. It's become equivalent to flat earth. It's become equivalent to anything that you name it that people think is ridiculous. As it should be. After all, a completely literal interpretation of Genesis would lead you to be a flat earther. But AIG regularly ridicules flat earthers and complains when they are compared to flat earthers. But those parts of Genesis were apparently metaphorical. There wasn't a literal firmament separating space water from earth water. That's a metaphorical reference to something else. And actually, I'm giving that a better explanation than the actual Answers in Genesis explanation for that is, because one of their explanations for the fact that Genesis describes a solid dome above the earth is to suggest that everyone in history, including the ancient Hebrews themselves, misunderstood and misinterpreted the ancient Hebrew word used to describe the firmament. So to Answers in Genesis, the idea that the ancient Hebrews used an ancient Hebrew word wrong, and modern young earth creationists are the only ones who have figured out the true meaning of the word, is more likely than the fact that Genesis describes a solid dome above the earth. You know, because Genesis has to be true, and we know that there is not a solid dome up there. That's not something I appreciated just because I've grown up with, of course this is true. And so to, to discover there's a whole culture that's been erected against this to such an extent you can't even talk about it. You can't even talk about it, he says during the media interview for one of the largest Christian film distributors while sitting in a room overlooking a boat-shaped building built specifically to talk about it. Sure, you'd probably get some pushback from secular media, but y'all have no problems getting your talking points out there. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about creation? There's so many, but here's what comes to mind first having read so many of their books and thinking about the few times, because they don't do it much, the few times they try to engage creation science. Don't do it much? Dude, come look at my channel. Hell, you want to be interviewed by someone secular? I'll have you on as a guest. You can even promote your book a bit, but I'm not going to just throw you softballs. I'll actually want you to get into the nitty gritty. That's actually why I'm planning a face reveal soon. I want to start interviewing people on the channel, and that's a much more interesting thing to watch when you can actually see the people talking. So yeah, Social Blade says I'll get to 60k around November 7th. If you'd like to see me start these interviews sooner, then subscribe if you haven't. I know about 30% of you watching don't subscribe, so come on, hit that little button if you want to see my ugly mug. There's also a notification bell there if that's your thing. I'm, personally, I hate notifications for anything that's not a text message or calendar event, so I don't get why anyone would hit that for any channel, but it's a thing that some people like apparently, and apparently telling you to do it is what all the cool channels are doing nowadays. So this is me doing that for probably the only time ever. They treat it as if we're still in 1859.
I mean, the rate at which creation has come up with new arguments is such that most of their arguments are at least 50 years old, but I wouldn't go back quite that far, although there are certainly groups that like to spout talking points about Ernst Haeckel's embryo drawings from the 1800s, or the fact that Darwin's father came up with a rudimentary idea of evolution as well, not to mention all the times I've had to explain that we've known that the Earth is older than 6,000 years since at least a century before Darwin. It's not our fault that a lot of modern creationist talking points have been known to be wrong for more than a century now. What's the 1859 creationist view? It's the one that Darwin tried to push against. Darwin was not pushing against creationism. He was just explaining how the species of the Earth became so diverse. If the fact that evolution happens is pushing against creationism, then that's not evolution's fault. You can, you can get a sense for it just by reading his book. How does he treat his opponents? He treated his opponents exceptionally fairly. You'd be hard-pressed to find an example of Darwin being anything but a perfect gentleman with regards to people who disagreed with him. In fact, he often started out his correspondence with them by explaining exactly why he thought his opponent's position to be very reasonable and understandable before explaining why he was convinced otherwise. That's why that quote about the eye was phrased as it was. He was explaining that he fully understands how evolution of such an organ seems fantastical, but then he spent the entire rest of the chapter explaining why it's entirely plausible. His opponents in his book are people who think God creates every species in its current location, which doesn't at all fit the idea of God destroying the whole planet with a flood 4,500 years ago. I don't know if that's what creationists in the 1800s believed, but I have never seen anyone address creationism as if that is what they believe today, so that's a flat-out straw man. But that's what they viewed, erroneous, unbiblical view, and that's a fairly easy view to scientifically demolish. I can easily scientifically demolish that view. It doesn't come from the scripture either. Now show me where anyone taking on creationists today presents that idea as though it were what creationists believe today. This is one of the benefits of using a response video style. It's really hard to accuse me of strawmanning the creationists when I'm doing nothing but responding directly to what they are saying. I've never seen a creationist argue that position, and so I have never dealt with that particular position. And so that gives rise to all sorts of misconceptions about the Ark. Well, no way you can fit millions of animals on board the Ark, that's foolish. Well, of course, if that's what you think is what the Bible teaches, it's not. No. According to AIG numbers, it's anywhere from 7,000 to 16,000 individual animals, which is also foolish and totally unreasonable. There are about 5,000 individual animals at the Toronto Zoo, and I would be willing to bet that they have more than eight zookeepers taking care of these animals, because it would be way too much work for just eight people, even if it were only for one year. Oh, and also they require about 1.5 tons of food per day for these 5,000 animals, a good chunk of which is meat that needs to be refrigerated in order to, you know, not spoil. How did Noah refrigerate the meat for his carnivores? What the scriptures actually teach is that God creates kinds. These are not species, not even the next level of classification, genus, but family. Kind equals family. So humans are the same kind as chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. But saber-toothed cats and linsangs are not the same kind as modern tigers and house cats, while otters are the same kind as badgers. Excellent. So dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes are all part of the same family, even though they're separate species. What about hyenas? They're pretty dog-like, but they are more closely related to cats than to dogs. Weird that some things fit in between categories like that if the categories are actually distinct. Noah brings two of that family on board the ark, whole bunch of species form after the flood. That's a huge difference from what Darwin proposed. It effectively renders nearly all of his arguments against creation useless. Not really. It does make creationists into evolutionists, though. If it were only a few thousand animals on the ark instead of millions of animals, then there would have to have been a period of rapid evolution the likes of which no evolutionist would ever dream of proposing in order to get from the seven or 16,000 species to the millions of species that we have today. In order to get there, if evolution were at a constant rate, there would need to be about 1,500 new species of animal evolving every year for the past 4,000 years. But we don't see that. So instead, maybe there was a period of super evolution right after the flood. Either way, creationist models predict way more evolution than any of the evolutionist models. So he's got a bunch of arguments that demolish God creating species. They don't apply to this kind's view. And so Richard Dawkins coined, all these people aren't aware of this. Do you know what? 
evolution was not developed as a counter to creationism. So whether or not they were aware of specifically which version of creationism evolution was supposed to have countered is irrelevant. But in trying to figure out which version of creationism they might have been talking about, I did watch through Jerry Coyne's Darwin Day lecture from 2016, in which he goes through exactly why almost the opposite of what this guy has been claiming in this video is actually true in the US, with a huge chunk of Americans believing in creationism, and a huge chunk of the remaining ones thinking that evolution still needs God to direct it, and also pointing out that the only organizations dedicated to opposing evolution are religiously motivated organizations. If it were merely a matter of interpretation, you would expect there to be some organizations that are not religiously affiliated also opposing evolution, but alas, there are none. And continue to repeat evidences, because evolutionary evidences are largely unchanged since Darwin. Excuse me? You have a PhD in cell and developmental biology. You literally had to spend years of your life studying an area of science that contains a huge chunk of evidence for evolution, and it was completely unknown in Darwin's time. Creationists have frequently been gleeful about the fact that Darwin thought cells were some homogeneous gelatinous substance, that they were much simpler than they actually are. The study of cells and their contents is where we find a plethora of the modern evidence for evolution. I can't believe you could possibly get through Harvard's PhD program without learning this, so that can't just be you being misinformed or ignorant. That has to be a lie. Will he accurately describe an evolutionary position without building a straw man? To find out, tune in tomorrow, same Rhino time, same Rhino channel.